I want to share a revelation today uh, that I, I, I was wrestling with the Lord as I was driving over here, and I felt like the Lord told me that Andrew was going to have something that would confirm the word that I was called to, sh- to, to preach. And, um, and he mentioned uh, Hebrews 12, verse 3, about not growing weary and losing heart. And uh, I've actually been re- uh, writing a book on not losing heart. Uh, about the heart and the presence of God. And I feel like I've just been sharpening my sword around this revelation. And when he said that, I felt like the Lord said, wield that sword. And so I want to share with you uh, this, this truth that has been so personal. It's so near and dear to me. Uh, outside of the gospel, if I could impart one revelation to my kids, I have four kids, six, eight, 11, and 13, if I could impart one revelation to them outside of knowing Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, it would be this one. Uh, and it's navigating, it's navigating uh, life, navigating disappointment in life, navigating, uh, navigating when we expect life to turn out one way and it turns out another. You ever had that happen? All right, you're alive. So yes. All right. Um, I think that this gap between expectation and reality this, this gap right here uh, is, a, is a dangerous one if it's not given to the Lord and, yeah. and that these two things aren't reconciled because you will lose heart. Uh, hope deferred makes the heart sick. What's hope deferred? Hope is I thought it was going to turn out this way and it actually turned out that way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and if your heart is sick, hope deferred makes the heart sick. If your heart is sick, then your life is sick. Uh, Proverbs 4.23 says, From uh, above all else, guard your heart, for it's the wellspring of your life. And so your filter for how you experience life, how you process life, is your heart. And Jesus paid a lofty price to live in that place. 2 Corinthians 4.6 says that he who spoke light into darkness, the analogy of creation, let there be light, he spoke light into your heart, and he put the face of his son right here. He who lives everywhere, chose to, to live somewhere, and it's inside of your heart. And so that's the, the filter. It's the wellspring. But if we put our expectation in the leadership of the Lord to lead us over here and we end up over there, that filter can get tainted. And, and so what ends up happening is, is, is when, my, when my legs hurt, I can identify that pain. I can go, man, my, I hurt my right ankle. I was walking. I twisted it can identify the moment, the time, the place, the pain. But when it comes to our heart, oftentimes it's hard to identify. Like, whoa, I got something going on here. And so we end up having fruit that's wonky. I call it wonky fruit. We don't want wonky fruit, amen? And so we, we have this wonky fruit not really identifying that actually our heart has, has become hardened or sick, and so we're not living wholeheartedly. We've closed our heart off to the Lord and also to others. And so I just feel like today the Lord is going to take a, what are, what's this instrument called? It's going to open up our hearts. That's what he's going to do. There you go. You guys know what I'm talking about. Um, so if you have your Bibles, uh, flip over to John chapter, 15, John chapter 16. Uh, John 16. And... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a lot of scripture this morning, um, so roll with me. Uh, this is the Upper Room Discourse. Uh, in the early days of the Upper Room, I would read these four chapters every single day. Uh, this became like a, a if, if, if scripture's a forest, this was a well-worn path for me. And um, I, I felt like the Lord, uh, th- there's a number of like high-level theological truths in John 14, 15, 16, um, it's the introduction of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is saying, I'm going away, uh, but it's to your advantage that I go away, for I'm going to send a helper. But as I was reading this over and over and over and familiar with some of these, these, these again, significant truths, the vine and the branches, I saw this, this trail, this breadcrumb that the Lord was laying out for his disciples in light of what they were going to go through. Uh, these men had left everything to follow him, and Jesus is telling them, that's how he starts out this conversation, hey, I'm going away. Where I go, you cannot come. I'm going away. And what Jesus was setting them up for is they had this expectation of how things were going to turn out, but those expectations were about to be utterly shattered. 
everything they thought Jesus was going to do, everything uh, that they thought would come about under his leadership is actually not going to happen. And, and so the disciples are going to get sick in their heart. And in John 16, this is the beginning of that sickness. Uh, he's really turning up the heat in this conversation. He says, hey, if they persecute me, they're going to persecute you. If they hate me, they're going to hate you. In fact, there's coming an hour where people will kill you, and they'll do it in the name of serving God. And, and as he's telling them this in John 16, verse 5, he says, but now I am going to him who sent me. So I'm going away, and none of you ask me where are you going. Verse 8, but because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Sorrow has filled your heart. Because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Now he starts out, flip over one chapter, uh, two chapters in John chapter 14. He starts out by saying, do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let your hearts be troubled. But as he, as he begins talking, you see that, that, that what he's telling them actually troubles their heart because in John 16, 5, it says, because I've said these things, sorrow is actually filling up inside of your heart. And our hearts, our hearts cannot handle sorrow. We are not hardwired to process sorrow outside of a relationship with Jesus. Your heart, just like sin, we can't touch sin and not be marked by it. Like, my personal sin, your sin, public sin, without the leadership of Jesus, we're in trouble. And sorrow, when found in a human heart, outside of connection to the Lord, it will shut a heart down. And I, I, when I came to Convergence, I, in the early days, I grew up Church of Christ kid. So, um, I love the Churches of Christ, grew up loving the Bible, but I didn't know a ton about the Holy Spirit. And one of the things Convergence gave me a grid for is life in the spirit, specifically the kingdom manifesting in the forms of signs and wonders. We believe he still heals today, amen? And so I started contending for healing. Uh, I was working uh, in that tradition. And guess what? As I started praying for people to get healed, people started to get healed. It was really profound. Um, In fact, as the young adult pastor at that church, I kind of became known as the guy, if you had a sick relative or if someone was sick, hey, have Michael pray for you. And it was a passion of mine. I loved praying for the sick. And and I was batting, you know, I was was seeing more people healed in that season than I was before because I was actually praying for the sick. And and so um, randomly, one, one, one weekday morning, I was in my office and and the, the, the secretary, this was before everyone had a cell phone. We actually had a church phone with a secretary who would answer the phone. And so she answers the phone, and on the other end of the line was a, uh, a mom whose son had had a dream the night before. Now, uh, this son had just come back. He was a freshman at the University of Texas. He had just come back to Highland Park um, because his cancer that he had had as a young, uh, I think in an adolescent age, had come back. And, uh, and so he was undergoing treatments to deal with the cancer in his body. And the night before, he had had a dream that his mom called a church of Christ, and a pastor from the church of Christ came over to his house, prayed for him, and he was healed. That's a pretty profound dream. And so the mom called two churches prior to calling our church, and they said, we, we don't have a ministry like this. And they directed them to the church that I was working for. The secretary gets the call, and she says, I know exactly who to transfer this call to, Michael Miller. And so I'm on the other end of the line hearing this desperate mom tell me about this dream that uh, her son had had. And within hours, I was at their doorstep. And I, for the first time, met Willie. Uh, Willie was this 19-year-old kid uh, I walked in the room. Um, you could tell he was undergoing chemo. Uh, he, he was so full of life, though. He's one of those kids that, one of those p- people that, that make you feel like you're the center of the room, you know, when you meet him. And we start talking about music, sports, and then finally went to his diagnosis and the dream. And so I laid out a theology for Jesus being a healer. Um, I invited some more of my friends over the next couple of months. We started going and we were praying for Willie. And over the course of, this was 2006, early six, over the course of that that January, February to the summer, we saw Willie's 
cancer uh, go into remission. Um, we saw, we saw, it was really profound. Like the doctors, the doctors' treatment were working, but it was working much better than they said it should have worked. And, uh, and, and I remember I, I, I started dating my wife in that season. I met her. We were going to the Coldplay concert. Anyone been to a Coldplay concert? Just like glorious. Um, the concert was in downtown Dallas. Willie lived near downtown Dallas. We drove by to meet Willie because he loved Coldplay, just to tell him about the concert we were going to go to. Like, Willie became a friend. He became uh, a part of, of, of our lives in that season. Um, that would, so I said the summer. That was early May-ish when, 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 when that was happening. Uh, Willie was making plans on going back to the University of Texas, uh, summer hit, I lost track with the family, thinking he's going back to the University of Texas. August of that year, somewhere around August, uh, I get a call from Willie's mom. And, and, and she said, Michael, we just got back from the doctor. The cancer's returned. And it looks like it's more aggressive than it was when, when we started praying for it early in the year. And so I reminded her of the dream, reminded her of all that we had walked through, and we start praying for Willie again. Uh, long story short, over the next couple of months, uh, Willie's cancer uh, came back with vengeance, and um, Willie, Willie's body succumbed to the cancer, and Willie died. And I remember, uh, I remember so vividly um, the emotion and the frustration, even anger, that I had towards the Lord because of this journey that I had been walking on with Willie. Uh, I had to go to church because I was employed by the church. And I remember it was a Saturday night. Uh, we had Saturday night service. I was in the service. I remember when they asked people to stand up, I would sit down. And I wouldn't sing the songs during the sermon. I went to the back, and I remember just telling God, this is cruel, that you would pick out a pastor in the Metroplex, Church of Christ, invite me into this family's journey, and pray for him. And this is the end. This is it. I was frustrated. I, expectation, reality. And I knew it was a crucial moment for my journey with the Lord and knowing him as a healer. I didn't doubt that he was real. I just doubted his nature. I doubted some of his promises. And, and this, this moment, this, 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 this place, I, 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 I didn't know what I was going to do. Now, I'm going to pause there because this is where the disciples would find themselves in John 16. I'm going to share, remind me to share a dream the Lord gave me that night at the end of this message that I think will be extremely redemptive because it was helpful for me. But in life, sometimes the Lord's leadership doesn't always look like what we think it should. And... The outcome of that, or the, the, the manifestation of that, is that sorrow will come to our hearts. And Jesus in John 14, he's saying, I'm going away, I'm going away, I'm going away. You can study this out. And his disciples are trying to clue in, well, where are you going? Goes, I'm, I'm going to my father, be with my father. I'm going to go prepare a house for you and many rooms. Lord, can, can we go with you? And, 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 and these questions start to emerge. But Jesus isn't giving them the exact answers that they wanted. And and so here in John 16, verse 5, go there. um, It says, but now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you asked me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Now, I want to give you three symptoms of sorrow from John 16. Uh, uh, The first first symptom here is found in verse 5. It says, and none of you asked me, where are you going? Well, if you flip over to John 14, Jesus says, John 14, 1, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Um, In my Father's house, many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come to you again and receive you to myself. But where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way where I am going. So Thomas has the obvious question in verse Five, Thomas raises his hand. Lord, I have a question. Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? So, Lord, where are you going? 
And I told you I was gonna show you symptoms of sorrow in a heart. The first symptom here is we stop asking questions to the Lord that we once asked him. Because in John 16, verse five, he says, but because I, uh, uh, but now I'm going to him who sent you and none of you ask me, where are you going? So Thomas had just asked this question, Lord, where are you going? But as Jesus starts talking, Thomas was no longer asking the question that he once asked because he didn't understand what the Lord was saying. So questions are really important. Questions that we ask to the Lord are really important. And what sorrow will do is we'll shut our hearts down from asking questions to the one that has all the answers. And so do you know what we do with those questions? This is symptom number two. Look in John 16, verse 16. This is the second symptom. A little while... You will no longer see me, and a little while you will see me. So this is the hide and seek. Some of his disciples said to one another, What is this thing that he's telling us? A little while, and you will not see me, and a little while you will see me. And because I go to the Father. So they were saying, What is this that he says? A little while. We do not know what he's talking about. So the disciples are confused. They don't know what Jesus is talking about. So here's the second thing that we do. Uh... The questions we once asked Jesus, where are you going? In verse 17, some of his disciples then said to one another, what we end up doing is we start asking questions that we should be asking to Jesus to disciples around Jesus. So we start living vicariously through others to him. We have a secondhand relationship with the one that's right before us. Oh, hold on. This is really good. We start running to the things around Jesus instead of actually going to him. We, we start to develop a relationship with the scaff, scaffolding that was to support the structure and the substance than actually going to the substance. Jesus was sitting right in front of them. And because sorrow is filling their hearts, they're no longer asking Jesus the question, where are you going? Instead, they're like, hey, do you have any idea what he's talking about? And this question, where are you going, where are you going? This is one of the questions that sorrow forces us to ask. Where are you, Lord? Have you ever had something happen like me, Willie? I mentioned that story. We've all had some type of curveball that life throws at us. And, and what, it, what it forces us to face is what is our faith in? What is our faith in? Is he really where he says he is? I can show you, show you another question they ask in John 14, but for time's sake, I'm not going to do it. But it's what are you like? What's his nature like? Where are you and what are you like? And when expectation, reality, this chasm, these two questions overshadow it. Where are you? And what are you like? I thought you were good. I've sung the song. You are good, good, right? I've sung the song. I've read the scriptures. But this does not look like your goodness. And so we have to reconcile our faith in the midst of the chasm, in the midst of the setback, lest our hearts grow weary and sick. So one, we stop asking Jesus questions. Two, we start to live vicariously through him. And then the third thing that happens, what was filling the disciples' heart? What was filling the disciples' heart? Sorrow. So go to Luke 22 real quick. Oh, this is going to hit. Are you ready? From the upper room, they go to the, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. And in Luke, Luke 22, verse 39, they came out, proceeded as was his customs to the Mount of Olives, And here are the disciples following him because that's what disciples do. When he arrived at the place, he said to them, pray that you do not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw. He knelt down and began to pray. So they go to the place of prayer. Uh, Jesus has his disciples. They follow him to the garden. Now, what's happening to the disciples' hearts? Sorrow is filling up inside their hearts. But Jesus says something to them that I think is really interesting. We're used to this text, but let's think think a little... uh, a little differently about it. Because, because if, if, like, if Steve, Pastor Steve, Steve Fish, invites you to Convergence on a weekday, 
And you're like, hi, Pastor Steve, what are you doing? Like, hey, I just wanted to call you up here to pray. We're going to go into the place of prayer. Okay, I love praying, especially with the pastor. And he looks at you and he says, hey, you're going to sit here. I'm going to go over here. But while you're sitting here praying, don't sin. And so Steve's over here praying. He invited you to pray. What are you going to be thinking about over here? <laughs> like, what does he think I'm going to do in the place of prayer? Like, I'm up here to pray with the pastor. Don't sin. Don't give in to temptation. What is Jesus talking about? Like, I would be a little, I would be triggered. I would be triggered. I, I may not even enter into prayer. I want to have a conversation. Like, do you think I brought a flask to the place of prayer? <laughs> do you think I'm going to look at something on my phone that I shouldn't look at? Like, what, why would you tell me don't sin in the place of prayer? It's, it's worth asking. But Jesus is warning them, hey, don't give in to temptation. As I go and pray over here, don't sin. And guess what? The disciples are going to fall into sin. And it's the residue from the conversation that they had in the upper room discourse. Because read on, look at this. Verse 42. Jesus begins to kneel down and pray, Father, if, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him. So Jesus is having this encounter, angels strengthening him. In verse 44, you see the, 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 the work of salvation beginning. Jesus is going to bleed for the first time. And being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and sweat became like drops of blood. I could make an argument this is the first time Jesus ever bled. It's a significant moment in the life of our Lord and Savior. But look in verse 45. When he arose from prayer, he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping because they were tired. That's not what it says. He came and he found his disciples sleeping because they had a food coma from the Passover meal, from the wine that they drank earlier. No, this, this was not a sleep caused from natural causes. It wasn't about them being tired physically. They fell asleep from sorrow. That preposition is so important. They fell asleep from sorrow. Where did the sorrow come from? It came from the words that Jesus was saying. Jesus is saying, hey, I'm going to lead you to a place. I'm, I'm, I'm heading somewhere that you can't come. They're falling into sorrow because their expectations and reality aren't matching up. And sorrow is filling that chasm. And the residue of sorrow led them to sleep, which would be the temptation of unbelief, the sin of unbelief. That's what they were falling into. Here's the progression. Jesus in John 14, 1, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. He starts talking to them. And because he's telling them things that are troubling, that trouble manifests in the form of sorrow. They go into the place of prayer, trouble, sorrow. Jesus says, hey, don't give in to temptation. They give in to temptation. They end up falling asleep. And this happens in our lives. Trouble produces sorrow. Sorrow produces temptation. Temptation produces unbelief inside of our hearts. And although we're awake physically, we're asleep spiritually. And our hearts have been closed off to the Lord because we thought we were heading this way and we ended up over here. Are you following me? This is the most, the most common command, do not fear, is connected to don't lose heart. D don't grow weary in heart. Oh. You know what's interesting? If you look in verse 47... It says in Luke 22, while he was still speaking, behold, a crowd came, and one called Judas was proceeding. He approached Jesus. Judas betrays him with a kiss. When those who were with Jesus saw what was going to happen, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Guess what Peter does? Peter takes the sword out. He takes up the cause. 
He's going to defend the Christ. But where was Peter four verses earlier? He was asleep. And I see a lot of Christians wielding swords, defending a cause, but their heart posture is just not right. They're they're awakening from a slumber. (laughs) And they're defending the cause in the wrong way. You see this culturally. Cue Facebook right now. Cue a podcast. Cue... There's a lot of swords flying around. And my hope and my heart is that we as born-again believers can live from a heart that's been liberated from what it's been through, from hope deferred, from setback. Because in John 16, 5, when he says, sorrow has filled your heart, this is one of the most famous verses that we use all the time in our stream. But it's to your advantage that I go away. Because if I go away, I'm going to send a what? I'm going to send a helper. He's saying it in the context of what's happening inside their heart. This is not about flags and dancing and worship music. It's not even about the manifestation of the kingdom on the earth and signs and wonders. He's saying, I'm going to send a helper who will be in you. Yes, he'll be with you, but it begins in the heart that the Holy Spirit resides in and it liberates us from all that we've been through. It liberates us from the disappointment. It liberates us from the hope deferred. It liberates us from any sickness that is inside of our heart. This is why the psalmist would say, sorrow may last for the night, but joy. There's a joy that's found in the Holy Spirit. There's a joy that's sourced by the Holy Spirit. In fact, Jesus in John 16, he says this, it, 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 you know, this grief is going to last for a moment, just like a woman who's in labor is in grief. But when the baby comes, because of the joy, because of the rejoicing, the sorrow will be removed. And he's prophesying of what's going to happen when they see him resurrected. Oh, you're going to get this. I really feel it's so, so crucial. Look at this, John 16, real quick. John 16, flip back over to the Upper Room Discourse. Bada, bada, boom. John 16, verse uh, 20. Truly I say to you, that you will reap, weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. But your grief, you will grieve, but your grief will be turned to joy. Then he gives the analogy, whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because the hours come, but when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that the child has been born into the world. Verse 22 is a prophecy. Therefore, you too have grief or sorrow now, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and no one will take your joy away from you. What will rejoice? Your heart. heart. It's really important that you see that. Your heart will rejoice. The heart that was being filled with sorrow will rejoice. It's a prophecy. And he says your heart will rejoice at a specific moment. When is it? Your heart, uh, verse 22, yes. But I will what? But I will what? But I will see you again. When I see you again, your heart will rejoice. So Jesus would be, would be uh, taken from them in the garden, and this work of salvation would begin. And just for, for time's sake, all that he went through, it's worth doing a forensic on the death of Jesus. Just to think through all that he endured for your redemption. And one of the aspects, I think, of the cross that's sometimes understated is how Jesus died. We know crucifixion, nails in the hands and the feet. Um, uh, Traditionally, typically, someone that dies of crucifixion would die because of suffocation. They they could no longer pull themselves up. That's why they would come and break the legs of 
uh, the victim being crucified so that he could no longer pull himself up and, and literally he would, his lungs would collapse, die of suffocation. But we know when they came to our Lord and Savior, they did not break his legs because he was already dead. And the psalmist gives us insight on how Jesus died because in Psalms 22, it says that his heart melts like what? Wax. And, and medically, medically, it's shown that that metaphor is true because when they put the sword in his side, it says blood and water came out. And what had happened is his body had been under such stress it was such a traumatizing process what his body had been through, through the, the whipping post and just, just all that he endured, that they think the stress in his body, his blood, the, the, the water in his blood began to separate and that his blood became so thick that his heart could no longer pump the blood. And so Jesus didn't die of suffocation. Jesus died from cardiac arrest. He died because his heart could no longer pump the blood. He died from a broken heart. And this is significant in how he died because his death was our death. He, he became sin so that we could be the righteousness of God. So he died of a broken heart so that he could give us a new heart. And he says, when I see you again, what will happen? Your heart that's filled with sorrow, broken down, in unbelief, it will rejoice at the sight what it sees. So guess where this prophecy is fulfilled? in the book of John. I'm going to show you exactly where he healed his heart. John 20, 20. This was the 2020 verse. John 20, verse 20. This is after Mary comes in. Actually, start in, uh, if you would start in 19, John 20, verse 19. So when it was evening on that day, this is the, the, the day that Mary comes in and says, I've seen the Lord. That was the verse before. The first day of the week when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. So this is, this is a heart that's filled with sorrow. It's shut up. It's locked down. Fear of the Jews. Jesus walks through their walls. He stands in their midst and he says, peace be with you. Go to 2020. And when he had said this, he showed them. What was the prophecy? When I see you again. He showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. What happened to the disciples' hearts? The disciples' hearts got whole because they caught a glimpse of the resurrected one. And look in verse 21. He gives him peace, and 22, he breathes the helper into him. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. I think this is where they got born again. And I think this is where their hearts got established in the reality of the resurrection. The reality of the resurrection. Woo! This gives you leverage. Sorrow may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. There's something about getting a glimpse of the resurrection, especially in our day of trouble. Um, I, I mentioned I'm, I'm mad at God. I'm at Saturday night service. It's really cruel of you to lead me to this family and this to turn out the way that it does. Willie's funeral was the next day. It was on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, I had to go to church again on Sunday morning because, again, I was on staff. And I was driving to the funeral. It was pouring down rain. I was on 635. My wife's sitting next to me, and I remember a dream that I had the night before. And this dream, uh, I've seen this dream heal a lot of hearts. I don't think it was just for me. I think it's for those that have struggled with hope deferred and heart sickness. Um, and this dream actually became, uh, it, it became an anchor for my soul in the midst of future trouble because I'm convinced that the Lord will meet us in the day of trouble, that the Lord will speak to us, that the Lord will give us words, he'll give us pictures, he'll give us dreams, he'll give us scriptures that anchor us through the process that we're about to walk through. And so here I am, day of trouble, angry at God, and I'm driving to the funeral and I remember this dream. And in the dream I was playing golf, which I'm a golfer, I love to play golf, God speaks to us in our own ways, right? And so I'm playing golf, I'm playing golf at the Dallas National Y'all may not know what the Dallas National is, but the Dallas National is the nicest golf course maybe that I've ever played. Um, it's beautiful. Like, you go there, they have caddies that carry your bags. Like, they'll go find your ball when you don't hit it well. They'll read the greens for you. They have little comfort stations every 
so often, which are like little convenience stores where everything's free. It's just, and that's in the natural. That's not in the dream. That's true. <laughs> it's true. So here I am playing in the dream. I'm playing the Dallas National. I get to the 18th hole, and I'm walking off. And uh, uh, Willie is driving in a golf cart. He's driving down towards the 18th green. He gets out of the golf cart. Willie has really long hair. He's hearty, healthy, muscular, and he's smiling from ear to ear. And I said, Willie, how are you? He said, I'm doing great. We hugged. And he said, he said uh, I- I'm bringing a word to you from the head pro. And the head pro has an invitation for you to come and, and meet with him, talk with him. And so I was like, sure, Willie, take me up there. So I get in the cart. Willie drives me to the pro shop get off. I walk in the pro shop, and I love a good golf pro shop. Uh, This was that. It had all the clubs and shirts and just like an amazing place. I walked towards the back, and there was someone behind the desk looking at the course, and he turns around, and it's the head pro. He's got these bright blue eyes, long hair, and he's smiling, and he says, Michael, uh, how did you enjoy your round at the Dallas National? I said, I loved it. And he said, I want you to know this isn't a typical round at the Dallas National. I said, okay. He said, I'm going to give you two options. Option number one is you can remember this round, and you can take any shirt on this rack. And there was this beautiful rack of golf shirts, which I love a good golf shirt. And he said, or you can play again. And I remember in my dream, I didn't hesitate. I grabbed the ticket, and I said, I'm going to play again. And as I'm driving to the funeral and I'm telling my wife this story, all of a sudden the revelation hits. The Dallas National to me is heaven on earth, which is my theology for praying for the sick. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I played around. It was a good round, but it wasn't a typical round. And I had two options. I could wear this shirt to remember what happens when 19-year-olds get cancer and I pray for them. And this would become uh, uh, something that I wear just to remember this memory. I could shut my heart off from praying for the sick in the future. Or I could yield to the mystery of this moment. And I could grab that ticket and in faith keep playing. And I decided in the dream I'm playing again. And since that time we've seen cancer healed. I haven't seen a 19-year-old boy yet healed of cancer, but I'm believing I will. But here's the thing, is that that dream healed my heart in a moment. All of a sudden, I went from being frustrated and angry to I got a perspective that I needed in that moment. And I think this is what the Lord promises us personally, to meet us in those moments, that the light and momentary affliction that we've been through will produce in us an eternal weight of glory. He wants our hearts whole. Amen? Amen. And so if this is you, I just want to pray. If, if this is resonating with anyone in the room, I, just, I would love for you to stand to your feet, and I want to pray for you. If, if this is resonating, if there's, if there's sorrow, that you're like, ah, there's a moment, there's a day of trouble, there's something in my heart, I want to pray for you, and I want to ask the Holy Spirit to give you a glimpse of the resurrection. It may be a verse, it may be a picture, it may be something in your mind's eye. He may remind you of a word that you have from the Lord, but I just want to pray that the Holy Spirit will minister to your heart because he paid a lofty price for it. And so, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name for every heart in this room. And, Lord, where there's sorrow, Lord, where there's been disappointment, where there's been hope deferred, where reality hasn't turned out, like we thought it would, would you step into that chasm, Lord, and would you take a deep breath and would you blow upon the gardens of our hearts and would you restore, would you renew, would you awaken, would you make fertile once again? Would you say, today, if you hear my voice, do not harden your heart. And where our hearts have grown hard, Lord, through trial, through the fires of life, Lord, where we haven't grown tender, but we've grown hard. I pray in your mercy that you would pour out your spirit in a fresh way into the wellspring of our hearts, Lord Jesus, and that you would flush out 
flush out sorrow, flush out disappointment, flush out unbelief right now in the name of Jesus. And that we could see and behold the one who has overcome. The one who has overcome. It's you, Lord Jesus. And that we would play again, God. God, just where we've, where we've worn, where we've worn memories, where we've chosen just to put on memories and say, this is simply what happens. This is what happens when you raise a kid. This is what happens when you work a job. This is what happens when you get involved in ministry, where we've made these agreements, Lord, through pain. I pray right now you would take off those garments. Lord, you would remove those garments. You would remove those agreements. You would remove, Lord, those places in our hearts, Lord, where we've chosen to close our hearts off to you and your plans. Because, Lord, I believe right now that you're breathing resurrection power and life into these wellsprings. You're establishing our hearts to see from your perspective, God. And Lord, we can just choose to yield to the mystery of what was in order to embrace the destiny of what will be in Jesus' name. Deeper still, Holy Spirit. Deeper still, Holy Spirit. This is the helper coming to help us. It's an internal help, God. Where there's depression, God, where there's been anxiety, where there's been just fear of people, fear of leaders, where we haven't trusted leaders, where we've made judgments against leaders, where we've made judgments against systems and churches, and it could be a lot here, but Holy Spirit, would you just flush it out and make us like children again? Make us like children again. Said, let the little children come to me. Would we come to you as we are so that you can do what only you can internally to our hearts? Just see the Lord. I feel like there's someone that, that has had uh, it's migraines and insomnia. I hear those two things. It's where there's been uh, migraines. You've been struggling with migraines. Maybe they've hindered you from sleeping. I pray, Holy Spirit, right now, you would break off. Any torment, God. Jesus' name. You're the Prince of Peace. Breathe peace, Lord, upon those minds. resurrection thank you that if, if, if you could just if you're if there's sorrow if there's a specific thing if you could just lift your hands to the Lord I just see you saying Lord take this yes. there's an exchange sorrow for joy yes. sorrow for yes. joy pray for that heavenly exchange God heavenly exchange let the winds of God Come and pick up what needs to be picked up and impart what needs to be imparted in Jesus' name. Lord, bind that which is broken. Mend that which has been severed, God. Mend it now in Jesus' name. Bind up the broken parts. And I just see you smiling, looking at your home, which is our hearts. I just hear him saying, honey, I'm home. Honey, I'm home. Honey, I'm home. Honey, I'm home. He's stepping into the place that is rightfully his. And so, Lord, we repent for being in unbelief. We repent 
for wrong judgments. And we receive, Lord, hearts of flesh once again. We love you. We honor you. In fact, if you're with a spouse or a friend, if the Lord's speaking, if there's an area, could you just, could you just grab their hands and say, I'm giving the Lord, and you can name it? Just feel there's something about confession. Just if you're with someone that, that, that maybe there's a ministry team, but I feel like there's some way that we need to see us grabbing hands and saying, I, I am surrendering this to God this morning. I'm laying it down. I feel like offense is a big one. There's some of you, you've developed offense towards the Lord because of offense. I feel like you naming it and laying it before him in Jesus' name. Just if you would, if you would, if you would do that, if you would grab someone's hands that you're with, just name that thing. Maybe it's a relationship that's lost. Thank you, Lord. place. In Psalm 27, David says, for in the day of trouble, you will conceal me in your tabernacle. But then just a, a, a little bit further, he says, and you will lift me up on a rock. And I saw this picture as Michael was talking, and it was the picture of, of sorrow. It was the picture of hearts struggling, uh, hearts that are troubled. And I saw as there was this place of the Lord coming in, I actually saw him raising you up on a rock. Lifting you up on a rock. What happens when you're on a rock? You can see your perspective changes. You can see things differently. You see things you didn't see before. And so Lord, I thank you that as we, as there's this exchange happening, I see some of you like circumstances have, have, it's like you've been stuck and I see the Lord pulling you out and setting you on a rock. So Lord, we just release that right now. I thank you, Lord, that where there's been mourning, Lord, that, that you're releasing joy, that you're releasing peace into hearts. Jesus said, do not let your heart be troubled. Lord, we just ask you that we give the trouble to you. We give the things in our heart to you. And I ask you right now that some of you in this room, your perspective is going to change when you walk out th this morning. Because when that heart shifts, the perspective changes. You see him in the midst of it. You see him in a way that maybe you didn't see him before because he's lifted you on a rock. And so, Lord, right now we just release. I just ask you even for fresh perspective, Lord. Fresh perspective on situations. I specifically see finances. The Lord is giving some of you whose hearts have been troubled from that place. He's giving you a fresh perspective. So Lord, we just ask you this morning, we thank you that you're lifting us up. I just ask you even, some of you, you even need to lift up your hands again. And you just need to say, Lord, lift me up. You're lifting, you're lifting that load. You're lifting that burden. You're lifting that sorrow. You're lifting that heartbreak. You're lifting that offense. You're lifting that bitterness. You're lifting it. You're lifting it. And you know what happens when he lifts it? 
It's like that song, the air gets lighter. My soul gets lighter. (laughs) There's a lightness. So Lord, we just thank you for what you're doing, Lord. And we just bless, I bless hearts in this room, Lord. And we just even ask you, Uh, for hearts that need to just be awakened. We just ask you that you'd awaken our heart, Lord. That you would awaken us from the slumber. That you would awaken us from the place of sorrow. So we just thank you for everything that you're doing. 